Few diseases can strike fear into new parents as much as meningitis. Whilst it is a disease that primarily affects infants, it can still impact teenagers and adults, especially those who are immunocompromised. Meningitis is a disease brought on by a viral, bacterial or even fungal infection, meaning it can be brought on by all manner of pathogens and other diseases. In today's video, we will explain what meningitis is, its history and what can be done to reduce its impact. It is perhaps helpful to first explain what is meant by meningitis. It is the name given to the inflammation of the membranes that protect the brain and spine. Whilst there can be swelling of the brain, meningitis is described as the swelling of these membranes, or meninges. Primarily, it is the inner layers, called the arachnoid and the pia meta layers that are affected. Between these two layers is the subarachnoid space, which contains the cerebrospinal fluid. This fluid acts as a cushion for the brain and spine, whilst also providing nutrients. The fluid contains glucose, proteins, and a small number of white blood cells, normally 5 per cubic microliter. Meningitis will be caused when the pathogen reaches the inner meninges. This can be done by consuming infected mucus, sinus infections, or even sharing an infected person's utensils. Bacterial or viral meningitis will usually occur when the pathogen passes through the blood-brain barrier from the bloodstream. Once through the blood barrier, the pathogen will reproduce within the cerebrospinal fluid. The inflammation of the meninges will happen not as a result of the bacteria, but rather caused by the response of the immune system. Once the bacteria are identified, the body will produce a large amount of white blood cells to combat the bacteria. As a result of the influx of white blood cells into the cerebrospinal fluid, the meninges will become inflamed. As more white blood cells flood into the fluid, the levels of glucose will plummet. Levels can increase as much as 20 or 30 times higher than the normal white blood cell count. Meningitis is therefore best simplified by the higher than normal presence of white blood cells in the cerebrospinal fluid and the dangerous consequences of the immune response. A person will first begin to experience headaches and fevers, as pressure from the inflammation affects the brain, the person's neck will begin to stiffen. They will experience hearing loss and an aversion to light. Ultimately, a person will become incredibly confused, a telltale symptom of meningitis. As the body continues to fight the infection, sepsis can be triggered resulting in the infamous rash. Oxygen rates in the blood will drop, meaning it can lead to organ failure and death. Death can follow strikingly quick, sometimes within 24 hours. For babies, additional symptoms can include them refusing to feed, a stiff or unresponsive body, and a bulging soft spot on the top of their heads. One symptom often associated with meningitis is a red or purple spotty rash that quickly spreads all over the body. The rash will still be visible if a glass is pressed onto the skin. It is important to point out that symptoms can present in any order and that waiting for the rash if the other symptoms are present is not the correct call. To this day, there are approximately 2.5 million cases and a quarter of a million deaths each year. Early recognition and treatment is therefore vital, as the longer the disease is left untreated, the more damage can be done to those who survive. A person may require amputation of limbs or be left with brain damage even if they do survive. Hospital treatment is the best cause of action, as should complications arise, it is best to be monitored. For bacterial infections which are often more dangerous, antibiotics, steroids and fluids will be provided. With viral meningitis, treatment is usually not required at the hospital, though it is vital to establish whether it is viral or bacterial meningitis. A diagnosis can be done through blood tests or with a lumbar puncture. A lumbar puncture is the process of inserting a thin, hollow needle between the bones of the lower back and taking a sample of the cerebral fluid for testing. The history of meningitis might date back as far as observations made by Hippocrates. Another comes from Thomas Willis, 
an early pioneer in understanding the brain and nervous system. He noted patients who had an inflammation of the meninges with a continual fever in 1661. In 1805, the first recorded outbreak of meningitis took place in Geneva and was recorded by a general practitioner named Jespard Viuso. During this outbreak, patients were treated with ways that would attempt to relieve the pressure of the inflammation. Blood letting through leeches and induced vomiting were used as an attempt to treat the patients. It wasn't until 1887 that Austrian doctor Anton Fekelsbaum that a bacterial infection was linked to the cause of meningitis. The next major breakthrough came in 1891, a way to diagnose meningitis. During the 20th century, efforts were made to isolate and identify the many pathogens that lead to meningitis. As for the prevention of the disease, one of the more common ways is through vaccination. Infants are given a vaccine for the HIV vaccine that has all but eliminated one previous common cause of meningitis in countries where the vaccine is used. In the United Kingdom, the MenB vaccine is given to infants in their 8-week, 16-week and 1-year jabs. This protects against the meningococcal group B bacteria which are a common cause of meningitis in young children in the United Kingdom. Vaccines have since become a prerequisite for Muslims wishing to complete their Hajj, following a devastating outbreak of meningitis traced to the pilgrimage. Vaccines are also available to young adults in the United Kingdom in the form of the MEN ACWY vaccine. It is typically offered to teenagers around the age of 14 until the age of 25. The goal of this is to avoid the spread of meningitis at universities, where new students are at a higher risk of infection due to the close mixing with a large number of new people. Today, meningitis is prevalent in what is known as the meningitis belt in Africa, stretching from Gambia to Ethiopia. The meningitis belt of sub-Saharan Africa has the highest rates of meningococcal disease in the world. It is suspected that the low rainfall in this region allows for the greater spread. Those with a compromised immune system and those living in unsanitary conditions such as refugees are more at risk of contracting the disease. In 2020, the WHO set out the roadmap for defeating meningitis by 2030, which received unanimous support from the member states. The key goal is to rid the world of bacterial epidemics throughout the widespread use of affordable vaccines, improved access to care, and better disease surveillance. Like many of the diseases we have covered on this channel, the disparity between developed and the developing world is ever-present. Meningitis will remain a terrifying disease due to the wide number of pathogens that can lead to a quick death. It is a disease that will be a constant source of panic for new parents and for good reason. It is vital we understand the symptoms and the need to act quickly. Whilst the majority of deaths are very young, it is important to never forget that it can affect anyone of any age. We would like to end this video with a different, more personal note. Unlike many of the diseases we have covered on this channel, our family has been tragically affected by meningitis. Last year, our 19-year-old cousin passed away from the disease. The reason for this video is to raise awareness of the symptoms of meningitis and to act as a reminder that it can affect young adults too. Whether through this video or through other materials, we sincerely hope you will be part of recognising a potentially deadly disease and avoid further tragedy.